Hey everybody, this is Jesse Rodriguez Melendez and I'm coming to you live from New York. And joining me tonight is gonna to be a very Hi, special everybody. guest. Um, he is a veteran sportscaster, Rich Mancuso. We're gonna talk a little bit about, of course, the passing of our good friend, Hank Steinbrenner. Um, not only the owner, but son of the great and late George Steinbrenner. We're gonna talk about the 2020 season and what he's been hearing from insiders. And we'll, you know, we'll talk a little bit about whether or not will this even happen this year? Will this season even take place? And if it does, what are we looking at, you know, as fans? What are we what what should we expect? So we'll talk a little bit about that. And um, it's been a long time since I see my friend Rich. So let me bring him on to the screen so we can say hello and uh, we can get the show started. Welcome, Rich. Rich, do you Mancuso. hear me? Do you see me? How are you? I'm great. Um, it's so, good to see you. It's I, I know. Not finally, seen you in a, seems like an eternity. I know. It, it's been it's been a whirlwind since last yeah. year for us, Rich. Yeah, I know. As you know, I know. Um, and, so and now everybody is. I hope all is well. I hope everyone's safe on your end, and we're trying to manage. But uh, we'll see where this goes. Uh, you know me, I've been talking about something catastrophic for a long time and it came. Yeah. I just hope that I just hope that everyone stays safe. It's hitting home. That's what hurts. That's what hurts. Too many people are being affected by it. Not only mentally, but people that you know, families, colleagues. Yeah. You know, it's just it's horrible. But we need sports, right? Absolutely. We, and that and that's something that we're definitely going to talk about tonight, whether or not are we even going to have sports this year. Yeah. Um, so before we actually get rolling, Rich, I just if anyone's joining us, let us know. Just say hello or, you know, give us a thumbs up or, you know, give us some hearts. Let us know that you're here with us. Let us know where you're joining from um, so that we can say hello. And, um, you know, ask some questions. We'd love to make this interactive and answer any questions perhaps you may have. Um, we are on with veteran sportscaster Rich Mancuso. We're going to talk about um, the passing, the sad passing today of Hank Steinbrenner. And um, we'll talk some sports tonight. And of course, I'll have Rich shed some light and some insight as to what in the world is going to happen this year with sports. So Rich, let's start first with our good friend, um, Jo uh, uh, Hank Steinbrenner, we heard of his passing today. Super, super, super yeah. sad about it. Um, it was just, um, you know, I, I, Ray had shared a little bit with us that he hadn't been feeling so great. So I know for sure that it had nothing to do with coronavirus. Um, but nonetheless, he, you know, a great guy, um, really supportive when we started Hank's Yanks in the Bronx. Um, and so it was very, very sad for me to hear of his passing today. Yeah, I think it took us all back. I didn't know he was ill. And um, but they say that uh, he went quietly and he had been ill for a long time. And Clearwater is home, you know, an area that, you know, well. Yes. And then I'm, I've been able to find out further that he'd been ill for a long time. And apparently he was uh, fighting off cancer. And I heard that it uh, went. He had it went to the. This is uh, what I heard from sources that it affected uh, his brain. That that's where it originated. That's what I had heard, and, and no one knew that because he was uh, Hank was always in the background. He wasn't uh, the man in command no longer. As I wrote about it, as you read, um, so no one really saw him. We did because of Hank's Yanks, right? Uh, the time that we did. Uh, but nobody knew that he was gravely ill and sad that we didn't know that because we could have conveyed our wishes and all that. And um, look, it's uh, it, it's a loss, as you said, uh, as I wrote about. He was a uh, uh, he leaves a legacy. His dad Absolutely. left a legacy that we know, but he left a legacy and more so left a legacy because. He was in the background now, but he was helping kids. And we all know how both you and I feel about helping kids, young people, especially trying to get 
baseball as their career through college and getting into baseball. That was his purpose. That's what he wanted to do. And he achieved that with Hank Shanks and did it really well, as we both know. Um, and, and that's his legacy to me. More yeah. so, his legacy Absolutely. is that, than being uh, one of the patriarchs of the Yankees under his dad, George, and his younger brother, who was uh, really running the team. But, um, yeah, Jesse is a lot to talk about with him. Really is. And so... I'll take us back to that um, golf outing, the golf outing in 2017. We had the great pleasure of um, being introduced to him at that outing. Um, Was it had, 16, 17? It seemed like so, yesterday. So you yeah. and Tony actually spent some time with him in 2016. I wasn't yeah. at that event. I went the very right. next year because we had gotten right. involved with Hanks Yanks. And right. um, we were invited to go, and I was super excited. I think I've shared with you, Rich, uh, uh, probably a hundred times how much I admired, I know. Um, you know, George Steinbrenner, the man, not only because of the family person he was, but because of the incredible impact he had on, on you know, the sports world. And for me, I was always so impressed by what he did. Um, and then I think I also shared with you one time, I had the great honor of meeting his best friend, Stanley Kay, long mm. time ago. This was way before we had even anticipated ever being involved in baseball. And he used to share some of the most warm stories with me about George Steinbrenner, the man he was. And I remember one time saying to him, you know, all you hear about this guy, George Steinbrenner, is that he's like this hard nose, you know, real tough, badass guy. And he was like... I know the real George Steinbrenner and the real George Steinbrenner at the end of the day is this warm, loving, caring mm, exactly. philanthropist yeah. who really, you know, shed his, his, not only hit the, how much he cared, but he shared a lot of his money. Like he gave a yeah. lot and a lot, you know, to, to a lot of things that we don't even know about, you know, one story that I remember um, Dwight Gooden sharing with me that I'll always hold dear to my heart was a day that George Steinbrenner got on a, a plane headed to Tampa and Dwight was on that same flight. And Dwight, yeah. was, Dwight was seated in first class and George was seated a couple of rows ahead of him. And he, yeah. didn't, he didn't wanna interrupt George at the moment. So he, you know, he stood quietly, watched George sit down, you know, get himself comfortable. And just when he did, a woman came on with her baby and the stroller. And George Steinbrenner stopped her and said, where are you seated? And she said, oh, I'm seated in the back. He said, why don't you take my seat and I'll go take your seat and coach. Yeah, yeah. I mean, to me, that that just said so much about the man George Steinbrenner yeah, yeah. was. Doc told me that earlier today when we talked. Uh, he told me that story and much more, not only about George, but about Hank, about his son, about yeah, Hank so Steinbrenner and how Hank and Doc got really close, very fast. Close. And said the similarity of him and his dad was a replica of his dad. And when I first met Hank at the golf fight, that's the first time I met him. I've seen him, but this first time I met him one on one through Ray Negron, of course. Right. Uh, and I was amazed. I was awed at how similar he was to his dad. I'm, I, I thought I was too. talking to George Steinbrenner. That's I what know. I thought. And how personable he was, more personable than George. He was, and we we just shot the breeze. We talked about his father. We talked about Ray Negron. We talked about, of course, the Yankees and the direction. And by the way, what he said then, four or five years ago, four years ago, it apply it applies to today with luxury tax, free agent signings, long term contracts of pitches, as I wrote about today. Hmm. It all apply. He he knew it was coming. That's why he had the position he was in with the Yankees to oversee all that stuff. And he did it very well. But very similar to his dad in the fact that he looked like him, had that persona, mm -hmm. but much more personable and outspoken. And he was this type of guy. And, and George was charitable. We know that. Yep. And what he did. Community groups, all of that. But you know the story, Jesse. Hank Yanks, that was his baby. That, to me, is his legacy. He wanted to make sure that the Bronx 
And he kept stressing the Bronx that he had to be up there more. He loved it in the Bronx. Right. That, but he had to make sure that every young person that wanted to play this game of baseball got that opportunity and to play it the right way, organize, as you guys do at uh, the Baseball Training Institute uh, and did what, what it was called TM for years. Um, he did that. He did that. He made sure that – and there were I, I can't tell you how many young people – you 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 talk to in the tri-state area who said they've been a part of the program or couldn't be a part of it and wanted to be and uh, that's all because of Hank Steinbrenner he's the guy that looked out for young people in the New York tri state tri-state area to put these young people on the baseball dime in the right way to play the game the right way and most of all to get the education they wanted to get to the top and he spoke reality to them and yeah. he, had Doc, he had Doc Gooden and a lot of old former players talk to the pe young people as well. So we lost a legend today. We really did. He wasn't George. He was Hank. Right. Yeah. And one of the things that, um, again, you know, I admired so much and I still admire about the Steinbrenner family is their humility. Very humble um, mm. we did a couple of events and at one of the, um, fund one of the, um, donation drives we did during the whole hurricane event, um, uh, Maria for Puerto Rico, um, Julia and Michael, um, came through and they, they literally picked up boxes and helped and carried and packed. And I mean, it was just so, so yeah. amazing to watch how humble um, they all are. They're all let that way, and so they are. And um, you know, everybody thinks, yeah, everyone thinks they would just they're just business. And uh, look, I've had my attack. You know, when George was around, let him rest in peace. His legacy. I mean, it wasn't very, wasn't really nice. It was back and forth banter with him. He had right. his ways, right, you know, right. but. The real George Steinbrenner is what we know, what we have always heard. He had a heart of gold. He was there for the community. Yep. And he was there for the Bronx. As much as he said he wanted to take the Yankees out of the Bronx, that's because he was looking towards the future. He wanted a be uh, an improvement. He saw how baseball was headed with the bigger, new newer ballpark types of thing, new ballparks. Hank wanted that as well. But they didn't forget the community. That's yeah, they the were whole thing. Very always involved. Um, Multi-millionaire businessmen, as all baseball owners are. Right. That still gave a damn about the community where they were. And the Bronx, which was one of the lowest income impoverished areas in the country, and that area where Yankee Stadium is Morrisania, Absolutely. as we know. Mm -hmm. And that's 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 chronicled. That's right. known. Uh to get that type of support. From George Steinbrenner and Hank was a big part of that. Big forefront of it was Hank Steinbrenner. And they're making sure, again, that young people got what they needed. That's well, why he wanted to be up here more. He really did. He loved the Bronx. So uh, a, a real big example of that is what they did with Ray Negron, right? So Hank yeah, and Ray right. grew up like brothers. Um, you know, they spent a lot of time together, yeah. um, mostly because George Steinbrenner really took Ray Negron under his wing. And through yeah. Ray is how we connected um, and we were able to do a lot of the stuff we did for Hank's Yanks. Well, Ray, Ray was the guy that um, convinced Hank to take this program on the right yep. way. And Hank said, you want to do it? Do it. I trust you. I gave him the trust and it happened. Yeah. And, um, and gave him the support, which was important. Yeah. Very, yeah, very absolutely. important. And, and But Ray knew, Ray had that vision. Uh, and Hank followed. And But Hank was the forefront of it all. Absolutely. Um, so I want to, you know, I know as you um, and I want to just send our love, condolences, our prayers to the Steinbrenner family, to Julia, who I got to personally meet and spend some time right, with. Right. It was lovely, lovely and welcoming and warm, um, you know, treated us like they had known us forever. Um, and so right. for, for that, we're forever grateful. We want to send our condolences and our love and prayers to the Steinbrenner family on this night. Um, any last words you want to share, um, Rich, before we start talking about 
2020 and what do you think will happen this season? Uh, well, well, again, with Hank, it's uh, <clears throat> I'm sad in that uh, and did not know that he was chronically ill because nobody knew, as I said moments ago. And what I will always remember is what I wrote today, our first meeting face-to-face -face at the golf outing at the Hank Shanks charity event at Ferry Point here in the Bronx. He didn't have to spend time with me or any media guy that was there, but for some reason he knew us from the Bronx. Ray Negron introduced me to him, and he didn't have to spend that time. As everyone was going into the tent where they had the reception right adjacent to where we were by the clubhouse or the golf facility. Yep. But he wanted to talk to me, and he wanted to talk to me, and we talked for a good half hour had a little drink in his hand, and he was a cigarette smoker as I was, and I'm not smoking as much, Jesse. Don't get on my case. I know. Are you there? I'm here. I'm with Jesse? you. Jesse? I'm here. Okay. I'm here. All right. Uh, but he wanted to talk. We had a connection, and that was because of the cigarette or the drink. He knew I was from the Bronx. He knew who I was. He That, that surprised me. I didn't think he knew who I was. He had read my material. He knew I was a Met fan, not a Yankee fan. Yikes. And we got, we got a laugh out of that. And he had told me, and I didn't write this today. I should have, but I don't know, because it's just coming to mind now. He said, what do I got to get to you, get through to you to get you to come to our side? Uh, <laughs> and I said, no, I don't think that'll happen, but I have no animosity. And what he did was he opened the door for me to – to really understand the Steinbrenner family better mm. and to what they were all about. And he also gave me a better perspective. This was interesting. Gave me even a better perspective of where baseball was headed four or five years from then, okay, mm. four years ago. Revenue sharing, luxury tax, free agency, and what direction the Yankees were going. And up until this season – before we suspended operations due to the crisis, I was still writing things that he told me mm. because he saw that signing long-term free agents, especially on the pitchers market, wasn't the route to go. And if you look at it, he said also their emphasis was to develop their minor league system. And what happened to the Yankees in four years since then? Their minor league system got so much stronger. And a lot of those guys, including Luis Severino, as I wrote today, except for the uh, Tommy John surgery, Luis Severino became their ace next to CC Sabathia, right? Yep. And the youngster they were driving and talking about that he knew about. So the direction was the Yankees weren't going to sign long-term pitching contracts, with the exception now of Garrett, Garrett Cole with that mega contract, the biggest in baseball, especially for a pitcher, which shocked me, by the way. But um, he deserved it. There's no doubt. But he had told me they weren't going in that direction. And, of course, now we know he probably had no influence in it because he'd been gravely ill, I understand, for the past year. And that was unfortunate. So to get back to what you said, Jesse, uh, I will remember him as that type of person that opened up his heart to you that spoke the truth, mm -hmm. that gave you information that others might have not wanted to do. And most of all, his legacy that many people don't give him credit for, of helping young people in the inner city, in the community, as he did with Hank Shanks. Absolutely. And for that, again, I'm going to say how grateful we are. Um, super, you know, I think that a lot of people that know me, um, you know, more intimately know m how much I admired and loved George Steinbrenner. So to yeah. have had the honor of meeting his son, who for me, it literally, I, it was like looking at George Steinbrenner. I, it was just so, I was so in awe. Right. It was literally, he's like his spitting. His the replica image. of his dad. Unbelievable. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so yeah. for that, I was, I was so grateful. And then to find, you know, how sometimes you meet some celebrities and, and they're not quite as nice as you thought they were going to be. And so you're disappointed. There yeah. was definitely no disappointment with this family. I mean, meeting them oh. and seeing how humble and warm and loving they were towards us, um, really right, just made right. me love them and admire them more. 
Um, and so right. I'm just so eternally grateful to have had the opportunity to meet him, spend a little time with him. Um, you know, I'll leave you with this funny story. So when we get, when I finally get to meet him, right, we go, we go up to him, we shake his hand, he's very warm and he starts talking with us like he knew us forever. And Tony says to him, you know, she loves your father, loves your father. Like your father is her baseball like idol. And he says, you know, my father was a great father. He was an incredible, you know, man, but he was a mother effer as a boss. <laughs> yeah, yeah that, and, that we know. And I remember, know thinking, that. I remember thinking to myself, you know what? After being in baseball for a little while, and obviously not to their level, but understanding a little bit about, about what happens in the baseball business world, I can understand why. I can understand why you have to sometimes yeah. have that kind of persona because this is a tough business to be in. And, right. and you know, he, he handled business like nobody I had ever seen. Like he, no, he no. brought baseball to a whole nother level. Um, he started to change the game. It wasn't Bill Veck that changed it or anyone else. It was George Steinberg that changed the game, the complexion of the whole game. He really absolutely. did it. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know? With the Yes Network. And I mean, it was just so amazing. Right. We also, ironically enough, when we um, got our place in Tampa, this is what's so, so amazing and ironic to me. When we got our place in Tampa, George Steinbrenner is, is um, his place of rest is actually down the street from where we got our place. Wow. And well, I imagine how many times. Uh, I don't yeah. have to imagine. I know you. Yep. How many times you've been there? Absolutely. So, yeah. so I'm sure Hank will be laid to rest in the same place. Yeah, and it's I, I would think. I don't know. I don't it, know. It's lit and and so I remember that when I did go to visit, because we did go to visit um the, his uh his site, um I called Ray from there and I said, Ray, you know, I'm 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 you know visiting um the resting place of George Steinbrenner, and he said, he said look behind that, look behind his monument. So when I look behind, I, ironically enough, his monument sits right in front of the grave area for the children. Wow. So that's incredible. It, it's just, that you, gave, know, you know what? That gives me the chills. Yeah. It, it's just, there's so many, um, you know, so many of these uh, ironic moments that I've had um, an experience with this, you know, the Steinbrenner name that it's, it's, it's pretty ironic. Um, and nonetheless, again, we, sh we send our love and prayers. But you'll and never get his claw. You won't. Yeah. I'm sorry to cut you off with that. Jeff, but you won't get the same, uh, from, 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 um, how. Yeah. And what we're going to talk younger about. The younger brother is not, not the same. Yeah. We're totally definitely going to. Yeah, I, I wanted you to touch on that for a minute, Rich, because while we're sending our love to the family, and of course him included, um, a lot of people talk about that. I personally, like, I don't personally know the rest of the family like that. We, you know, we met them casually um, at some of the events, but don't know them intimately that way. But I, I will say, is that your phone, Rich? Yeah, it's okay. We can talk. I'm going to leave a message. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I wanted you to talk a little bit about, because I know you know them a little bit more intimately. You, you, you know, uh, cover all of the games at Yankee stadium. Um, and throughout the years, I'm sure you've encountered them. What, what's the huge difference between Hank and Hal? Uh, very easy to say. I mean, it, it, Hal is more, uh, business, you know, part of that corporate clan there. There's been a big, big difference in the Yankee hierarchy from the old ballpark to the new. Uh, and since George passed away in 2010, mm -hmm. uh, um, and, and then, of course, Hank went a step lower because he wanted to do that. There were any number of stories you hear about that. The two differences is the younger brother, and that being how is more business, it's more corporate. He's so caught up in that corporate ladder, and it's so difficult to reach him. It's so difficult to, he's not out there, mm. he's not out there. 
Uh, neither was George, by the way. George wasn't out there much, but he'd make him. You would see him pass through the press box. That was the old stadium. You would see George a lot. Uh, where I sat, his office was like just a few feet away. Um, but that's the difference. One was corporate. One one isn't as much, and uh, that separated the two. I really do believe the two brothers. Yeah, they they were differences. There were differences. I think it was a different philosophy. With but business, but right, when so. so when so when the late George Steinbrenner did pass away, Hank actually did take the reins though for a little while. Yes, he did. Yeah, and it's, and the, the story as I know it is that two things: he asked to go a step down. He really didn't want that role. He wanted the new position that he's that he was in up until he got really ill. Okay, uh, and that was to be like overseeing player contracts and strategy and direction of the organization and the team. He wanted that because he was going to deal more with people, which he liked mm. to do. Mm. And, and that's wh another reason why Hank Yanks got even better because he had control of it. The Yankees did and he did. Okay. Um, the other story behind it is that the A-Rod contract was so off base and got the Yankees into a lot of problems, especially the second one, the renegotiation. Now, was and that they, was that was that while Hank was in was in power while while Hank no, had they, they the reins? No, uh, uh, the first one, the first contract. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, the first one before the two hundred fifty million came up. Okay. The first one, and I don't think he was um, uh, the way he he wanted it. He went ahead with it. And then, of course, the, it backfired on the Yankees, and that caused a whole eruption. Mm. And that was one of the reasons he wanted to move away from that, from what I am what I was able to determine right. and what we were writing about when that happened years ago. Uh, so there are two parts to that. That and the fact that he would rather be where he was. He was more content where he was in that position. He loved being up here with the team, but he loved it more down in Tampa, being at the headquarters down there. He loved being down there to see the minor leagues, minor leaguers develop. He loved living in Florida where the family was, mm -hmm. and that's where he was content, and that's where he settled in. So um, there are two different stories about what developed. Animosity with the two brothers, definitely there was. It was business. It was mm -hmm. business. One guy had more of a philosophy. Uh, different philosophy, more corporate minded, and that being Hal than Hank. And Hank was the guy that was more people oriented and more the guy that could negotiate, but not that toughness. And, and so there was that little division. There's no doubt about it, but there was never a hatred. Mm. There was never a hatred. Yeah. Stein, the old man never wanted, would have never wanted to see that. They, they always honor. The Steinbrenner legacy. It always mm -hmm. honored what he did to build the Yankees back to where they were. From a from a, buying that franchise for a million dollars, that's all it was worth. And that was to becoming that was, a yeah, million that, dollar franchise. That was in what, 1972, 1971? Yeah, we bought, from right, Steinbrenner we bought it from, from uh, Right, right, right. Mm -hmm. And yep. um, that was the baseball story then, believe it or not, a million dollars to buy a team. Uh, and then, then it grows into this billion dollar franchise and, and the he most did lucrative that. in sports. Yes, he did yeah, because he, he was a businessman. Absolutely. Business man. And, and so I you know how Hal, Hal and Hank had different philosophies uh, on where this was going. And uh, just talking to the people I know in on it and all of that and that made the difference of the two brothers. But but again, as I said earlier, Hank was content in his role. That's where he wanted to be. Uh, 63 years old, that's young. I, I was really sad and again to hear that news today. It took me off guard, you know. And yep. it wasn't because of coronavirus. It was, uh, he, no. he had been terribly ill. Yep. So again, we send all of our love and prayers and thoughts to the Steinbrenner family. And um, may he rest in peace. He was a really great guy. Yes, he was. And uh, he's definitely going to be missed. Um, so we, uh, again, send our love and condolences to the Steinbrenner family. And um, 
we will definitely never forget him. That's for sure. Um, so now I'd love for you to give me some insider information about what is going to happen with sports in 2020, Rich. We don't know. Uh, and I also can say we don't know it because I get this question asked to me every day. Mm. We miss sports. We miss baseball, especially right now. We look forward to opening day in the season and all this came down, the pandemic. We just don't know, Jesse, because I think Major League ba Sports and all is just waiting for the medical authorities, the experts that we're hearing from every day with different reports every day uh, to determine when is it safe to open the doors. Um, and there's a lot of things. It's a, the, 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 the st testing has to be in place for this for this uh, coronavirus Testing has to be properly done, and everybody would be tested. Um, there has to be the proper go-ahead from the medical personnel, and I don't think they're nowhere near that right now because you've been hearing uh, there's two factors here, the medical part and the business part. Well, I think more importantly now it's the safety and medical part over the business, mm -hmm. and I think everybody would agree with that because we know what we're up against right now. We know where we're at. And I think sports is secondary right now. We have Absolutely. to look out for ourselves right now because this is hitting home with people we know, family, loved ones, friends, either passing away from this awful thing or terminally ill, about to pass away or sick with it. And, you know, I, I didn't get tested. I've had no symptoms. I'm Thank okay. God. Good. Everybody's asking me that. And I'm, I got a good immune system. Thank God. Uh, but you never know. That's just it. It's very worrisome. And I think that that, that alone is the answer. Uh, safety. And, and we just don't know about all sports in general. Or, and Major League Baseball, honestly, I feel will not come back. I've talked to numerous players in the last week when two different mm. proposals have come out that you've been hearing about. Mm -hmm. The first one about uh, in Arizona with um, – all teams housed and tested and quarantined away from their families and a robot umpire, double headers, seven innings, whatever, whatever. Mm. You know, players don't want that. They don't want to be away from their families and quarantined. When the awful event, someone gets tested positive, then they're all quarantined. They're not going to want that. The game gets shut down again. The second and latest proposal that's come out, that was reported first by U.S. State today, and Bob Nightingale, a great writer, a colleague, and he said, and they're talking about Cactus League in Arizona, and of mm. course, Grateful League in Florida, splitting up, no National League, no American League, teams would play each other in the vicinity of Florida that are there with their tra spring training complexes, and the same in Arizona, the Cactus League. No American League, no National League. In the end, when it would be over is... The, the champion from the Cactus League would play the champion from the Grateful League somewhere, if they can get them there in Florida or whatever, and that would be the World Series into November. That's another thing. Now, I don't see that happening, and I talk to players about it. They don't like the idea as much as they want to get back on the field, as much as they know they're losing financially here and they're getting paid till the end of May at some, some rate. Mm. And minor league systems are not working. They're not going to open up. That doesn't look like there'll be a minor league system this year for, for any team. And the players don't want that. The players want to play there as much as they want, and they want to do it the right way. So I don't see even the second proposal happening. And even if it did, it wouldn't happen until July mm. if they get medically cleared. There would be strict testing, and no fans would be allowed. And we all know that fans – Fans need to be there. The players want fans in the stands in all sports. Yeah, of it thrives, and not only is it a great the, the revenue. The, what happens here is the TV revenue will come in, not as much, which is a big part of the game economically. We know that, but the fans not there—that's a loss of revenue all over. And most, you won't see baseball in your city this year for sure, especially now, down in New York. It's not going to happen. So, so, and I know that you've spoken to some of the players personally. What, what, what are they hoping for, Rich? I know besides wanting to play, um, and I know that they um, have all. I, I've even heard how some of these guys are are actually giving to minor league players 
um, you know, to help out because this has become obviously a huge yeah. crisis. Minor league players are really, really suffering through this because as you and I know, minor league players paid. make peanuts. Um, yeah. And so, you know, a lot of these, these young men are sort of, you know, they're really put in a, in a really hard spot here. They're in limbo. Yeah. 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 Um, but from the players that you've actually spoken to, Besides, you know, knowing that they want to get back on the field, what are they, you know, their biggest concerns? Their biggest concern is health, safety. Their biggest concern is they not to be separated from their families. Hmm. They want to, they know we're, this is a pandemic. This is a major health crisis. We know that. They know it. They want to play ball. They're dying to get back on the field. And it'll take them time also as an issue of them uh, health-wise, an issue of them being properly in shape and condition. They have to go through another three-week spring training. And no That's minor league system, if a player gets hurt, with expanded rosters. They're concerned about that. But their biggest concern, Jesse, is safety, that no one tests positive. Because if they test positive, then everyone's quarantined, and they're not with their families. Right now, they're with their families to make sure everybody's safe and sound. They well, don't want to and, go back into a situation where they're going to be quarantined. And that makes lo that's logic. Well, and, and in addition to that, these guys are not training, right? They're not, no. they're not, they're not prepared. They're, to well, you know field. that most parks, even where they live, are closed mm -hmm. right now. And they don't know when they're going to open again. And if they don't have their own separate facility, or their own backyard, you know, and a lot of them do, but they don't have the equipment or the conditioning right. people around them right. to do it the right way. So they're not going to be in shape. And let's face it, they went already had gone through five weeks of spring training, maybe a little more if they got there earlier. To get back into shape again, you know baseball like I do. Mm -hmm. Being around the baseball man all your life, Tony. Yep. You got to be conditioned properly or you're going to get Absolutely. hurt. Absolutely. And they're Absolutely. afraid of that. They're afraid of that. So my my to go back to your question uh, with baseball with MLB, my gut feeling is there will be no season this year, and they'll start a new next year because there are a lot of consequences here, and there are a lot of tangibles involved, and there's a, there's a financial impact, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and look, it would be a ratings bonanza on TV. I wouldn't have an interest in it. I probably won't cover it because everything's going to be in Arizona or Florida if they do this. Mm -hmm. The season would be 81 games or less, no all-star game, and a postseason that would be totally different. And here's the catch. Either concept that they came out with, and the players told me this, we can't play baseball if we're not sitting in a dugout. We have to sit in the stands and be separated from each other. Mm. How do you manage a team like that? Come on. it's it, 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 Jesse, if it's, anything, to me, this is causing a buzz. That's mm. what it's doing. It's causing a buzz to keep the interest. Because, honestly, after talking to this one, talking to that one, scouts, some upper personnel, I just don't see how this is going to happen. And if it does, good for them. I'd have no interest in it. To me, it's not going to be a season. I'd rather they do it the right way. Wait till this clears. Isolate. Wait till it's safe. That you have the proper testing procedures in place. And then go at it. Start again next February with spring training. Go through your winter meetings. Do what you got to do. But you and can't so have a season the way to and, and so here's what's interesting. You're sharing on, you know, the major league level what's happening here. I'll tell you what we're hearing at the youth level, right? Because this is a big deal for us. Luckily for us, shut Rich, down. Yeah. Well, you know, luckily, luckily for us, we started our baseball homeschool at the very best time. My boys right. have not, they haven't missed a beat. My boys have been in school every single day um, mm -hmm. and they've been practicing. They've been training with Tony online. So for us, we literally you jump on it. Yeah. We, two years ago, I started this and everybody thought I was crazy for doing so. And here we are yeah. in the midst of all of this. And my boys have not skipped a beat. But here's what I am hearing from the youth sports world. And that is that there's still tournament directors that are putting out dates for this summer for these kids to play in tournaments. And I'm thinking oh, to myself. Right. I'm All thinking right. to myself, if the major leagues are going to pull the plug on the season, I don't see how in the world 
youth sports should ever take place this summer if we're this concerned about the potential of people still getting sick from this. Right. And more and more importantly, when we're talking about young players, right? Because they're not going to be yeah. going out there to get tested and they're definitely haven't been training. Look, um, you know, not not they're doing to, the not wrong to be thing. And, they, and they're sending a bad signal by doing that. They're yeah. sending a bad signal by doing that. And if you look at all sports, all the professional leagues, they've been talking about a potential startup date, and then they change it right away the next day because we don't know where this is headed, this pandemic. And, again, safety is the utmost issue. And and I'm going to give the sport of boxing a real kudo for this. They yeah. are the only sport, and they always get bad for not doing things the right way. Hmm. Every boxing promoter canceled everything to at least the end of June. And they've not been talking about resuming anything or scheduling anything until it's properly cleared. And if so, there still would be no fans going in the arenas. So I got to give the boxing business credit. The boxing business will hurt from this. No doubt about it. A lot of gyms are going to be closed for good. They can't operate. They yep. work on small budgets anyway. A lot of the fighters that are depending on revenue, they, 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 they can't live. So they have to find second jobs now full time. They got a wake-up call. That mm. box is not going to work for them right now. So the boxing promoters, except for Bob Barham today, a top rank, who said they're looking to book dates over the summer in Florida, in Orlando, at the WWE Performance Center, where they're doing – live wrestling events with no fans for TV. And Bob Arum and Vince McMahon, WWE, have a connection. They they do business. They've done it in the past. They're both in uh, they, the administration. They know well. They, they'll, the Florida governor gave them clearance. They mm -hmm. want to do that. McMahon mm -hmm. is doing a WWE. Uh, Bob Arum now is looking to do the same thing. And he might end up doing that somewhere in the summer. But for baseball, it's totally different. Because you're open right and there are more involved and there'll be no fans which is made of revenue so and the minor so now, leaguers you know i i have an interesting, i feel bad i really feel bad i have I, down it. I have an interesting question for you though had there been a season how interesting was this season going to be with everything that happened before the season yeah. even came to open right before we we even got to to talk about opening day um, there yeah. was all of this craziness already happening in the baseball world and, you know, right. the cheating that had come up and all that. What do you what do you think would have happened had we had this season this year? It would have been interesting with some new rules in effect. And I didn't like the one with the uh, the pitcher coming in out of the bullpen and had minimum had to pitch three batters. You know, they were trying to do that to speed up the rate of the game. Mm -hmm. And they were leaning towards getting towards the robot empire, which they would have done in this first concept to resume behind home plate. Mm. And they were leaning towards all different rules. But th that three pitch, that was the one I was interested to look at. How is that going to work? Because it changes the strategy of a manager, especially in the National League without, who doesn't have the DH. And a pitcher had to come in from the bullpen and pitch to a minimum of three batters. Usually, you have a left-handed specialist come in, go in, and get one guy in and out. No more to speed up the game. So that would have changed. I was going to see that would be different. And there were also uh, uh, times, again, experimenting with the length the pitcher could have the ball in his hand and throwing it to the plate, all of that. Baseball is not a game run on clock, on a clock, mm -hmm. as we know. Right. So, and and then the Houston Astro controversy. Right. Everyone was looking to see what was going to come out of that. Who was the first Astro? Who was the first pitcher to throw a ball intentionally mm -hmm. at an Astros hitter in the box? And, and that was going to be interesting. I think they were going to get booed all over the place. All and over the place. What 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 what's your take? I'm interested. I'm interested to hearing what was your take on that whole, you oh. know, cheating and that whole scandal. What's your take on that, Rich? I think two guys contrived the whole thing on that team to convince them in 2017. It was Carlos Beltran and Alex Cora. It's a mm. shame. Two great guys. I love them. Mm. And I think they contrived the whole thing, were able to convince others to go with the plan. 
Um, disgusting, deplorable, should not be allowed. Uh, I believe that uh, the Red Sox right now are getting away with it because they were next on the list of suspensions and whatever, mm. except for Alex Cora, dismissed as the manager. Right. Um, I really think there's no need for that in baseball. The, and I'm going to say it as I wrote it. It's deplorable. I don't see why they would even want to do what they did. But it was a plan contrived out of Puerto Rico because Cora and Beltran – you know, baseball in Puerto Rico, they play it that way. They bang garbage cans all the time. But and but more so technology did this. And baseball's learned from that. They learned how so so what to do you say their technology in the game? What do you say to the folks or you know, because I've heard this said a lot amongst, you know, the fans. What do you say to those folks that say, oh, this has been going on for years. There's always been this kind of stuff in sports. Yeah, yeah, that too. There's always been, you know that, there's always been cheating and robbing signals, but not electronically. Mm. It's, it's, it's always been done from the first base side to the third base side with coaches. They can get a signal. They can relay it to the infielder. So that's always been going. Cheating and cheating and getting and stealing signals have always been a part of the game. That's why you always see pitcher on the mound with the glove by his face, not to ward off anything, to give us an inadvert signal to someone else. Uh, that's why you always see the catcher throwing this finger down, that finger down, because they know signals are part of the game, and signals are part of the game to get robbed. And it's not, it doesn't okay. just happen in baseball, right? It happens in all sports. Uh, happens in all sports. There are signals that are done, but what made this bigger, as we know, technology made it easier. Yeah, cameras all over the place in the ballpark. That cameras everywhere. I, I again, uh, we as media, we get that access, we see things that fans don't see, right? We're able to get on the field, we come off the field, and then we go on the runway. And in the dugout, they got four monitors in every dugout. Mm. So you could see everything from those four monitors. And as you go, players in between innings going into the video rooms to see how to make adjustments at their next at bat. And those cameras also became a part of the scandal of technology. Those cameras contributed to what, what happened to the Houston Astros. They were made it easier. They had the availability to do it. And I think not only the Astros, a lot of teams did it, but didn't do it to the way the Astros did where they got caught red-handed like that. And look, I credit the media. I credit the uh, initial report that came out on one of the uh, websites that exposed the whole thing. Because so, if not, the whole thing would have been, you know, would have continued. And so, it's wrong. So do you think that, do you think that right now, some of the some of those players may be thanking coronavirus because it sort of saved them from all of the scrutiny and the <laughs> and the drama yeah, that this year is going to bring. You could say that ironically, yeah, right? yeah, without a doubt, because they uh, and look when fans come back to the ballpark when that happens, They're when not it's safe and this. sound to do so, they'll never forget. Right. This is They're something that. Well, it's become that that became the story, and it became a big one, and everyone knew about it. And the Astros became public enemy number one. And um, well, and it's a shame and do again you, that it had. Do you really do you really think that it, it was all of the players on the Astros, or was it just those select few that had sort of? No, I think a majority, plan? not all. I think a majority. Hmm. You know, a guy like Altuve, Springer, who we know real well. Right. We knew about it. Um, Maldonado. Maybe one of those guys that were on that championship team. And by the way, the Yankees are not angels here either. Okay? Yeah, I, I was going to ask um, you about that. They're not angels. They can talk all they want. And two things with them about this, they knew how to do it. They might have been doing it. I've heard from sources that they did do it, but did it in a different way. Not as cut, not as easy as the Astros did mm. with the technology, and call the Yankees and not Angels here. Didn't they win a World Championship in two thousand nine with steroid king Alex Rodriguez? 
Didn't they win many and, games with steroid king Jason Giambi? And and so and many others. And and so Isn't now that Angels. And so again, I ask you, right? So, and this is a good point that you're bringing up. Obviously, the cheating and you know being able to steal signals and all those kind of things. Yeah, that can win you games. But do you really? Do you? And now I'm asking you because I really don't know. I want to know. Do you really think that steroids does help a, an athlete like a, a, an Alex Rodriguez or you know a, a Sam Sosa it was, it was, or any of these guys? Proven. Yeah, that a body enhancement. Yeah, it so helped it, them. So yeah, it also hurt them. It also hurt them. Bones get fragile, mm -hmm. and it also hurt them. Uh, the body can only take so much of that, and a good amount of injuries from those guys. If you look. Limbs and thighs and hamstring, whatever. It's because of steroids that did it in that steroid era, and they still have those injuries now. And that's being attributed now because conditioning is different. It's got more to weight now, mm -hmm. so they can't use steroids, so they use the weights. And uh, you know, weights uh, change the game, conditioning, and that's contributed to a lot of injuries. And and here's another point: before I forget, you cannot nullify the 2017 Astros World Championship. You can't nullify any team that's been caught red-handed, even the Red Sox. It's in the record books. You can't take it away. You can't put an asterisk next to it. Right. And if you did, if you did, then all those guys that hit home run records like Barry Bonds, because which were attributed to steroids, and A-Rod attributed mm -hmm. to steroids, you have to put an asterisk on that record too, and that hasn't been done, has it? Yeah, no, definitely not. Hank Aaron is a legitimate home run leader. Leading, he's the home run leader. The home in baseball. run, yeah, king. They, he's the king, not not Barry Bonds. Okay, mm, mm. Pete Rose, all time hits king in baseball. Yet he's not allowed in the Hall of Fame because of a scandal because he cheated on the game. He bet illegally on the game. His own team. Okay, so you got to look into all of that also. So, and so do you? you know? So, so obviously this is going to be, uh, and and I I think I know the answer to this question, but for those of us that are watching, I think that it's it's good for you to answer. What do you think with everything um, great that Carlos Beltran did? Do you think that now this is this will be his legacy? That's it. He's ruined. He's done. Uh, Beltron's going in hiding. He's not going to talk to anyone, and I don't think he'll ever recover from this one. So, and and here's the difference. It's a shame. He had a and, chance. He and, with the Mets. He and I will, there. and I will say this, and that's that's a point that I was going to bring up. Do you feel like Alex Rodriguez has redeemed himself after all of the scandals that he was involved in? I don't think he's redeemed himself. I think he's contradicted himself. How so? In the way that he says things now. He, he tries to be apologetic in his commentary, mm. and yet he was the biggest cheater in baseball for a long time. So when he speaks about, for instance, when he speaks about the Astro scandal being wrong, mm -hmm. as it was, where does he come off speaking like that to a worldwide audience when he was the biggest cheater in baseball and only admitted to it after he was caught red-handed and he got suspended for a long time? A-Rod should not be as talented and as good as he knows the game. And he, yeah, he, do, and he, he does. does. He does, absolutely. Okay? And I love some of his, his analysis on the telecast. Mm -hmm. But A-Rod should not be on. He should not be broadcasting games as one of the biggest cheaters in the game. His legacy is that. His legacy is that. Is that. Not a legacy of being his home run hitter, not the legacy being his top 10 ball player of all time. But I, I think that he has, I think he's polished up his persona a lot in the last few years. Obviously, um, you know, now no, he had to, yeah, yeah, he had. He's, he's cleaned up his yeah, act. I, I think changed. on that end, I, I haven't changed my opinion about him and I'm not looking that he shoved yeah, me in the I, Yankee clubhouse. I, you, you and I have, we, we've shared quite a few words on this before, and I know that you're not an A-Rod fan. I, I mean, I happen to, I happen to admire the fact that he's been able to at least, you know, 
clean up his persona some so that at least people view him through different eyes right now because when the whole scandal hit about yeah. a rod everyone was mm -hmm. very angry and you know they they i mean the media attacked him pretty badly well, he should, um, by, by all means he should have been he and, wasn't he wasn't telling the truth if he had come out and told the truth the first time it would have been different like andy he pettit lied. Andy Pettit came clean yeah. right away right. and said, yeah, right. I, was, I was using, you know, whatever. Right. Um, right. I mean, any one of those back. guys back then, and I don't want to rehash the stellar area. We all know about the history and what happened, right. the Mitchell report and so forth. But any one of those guys who came out and said, I did not do steroids, never got my respect because we all knew they did. We all knew they did. They got away with it. And the owners – are responsible for that just as much because they knew what was going on and they let it happen to get those fans in the ballpark to see home runs. Right. So that's why they have those big attendance records. Let's face it. That's a lot of revenue in their pockets. That they right. Of course. Yeah. So now with, with the crisis that's currently happening, you're saying we won't have um, this season. Most likely so. it's not going to happen. I don't think um, so. So, so in essence, we're really talking about a 2021 season is what we're looking at. I would think in the best interest of the game for the players, the personnel, everyone involved, because baseball has one of the biggest operations of all the major sports. That's the best route to go. There's a lot of uncertainty right now. And in addition, more so, as I keep saying, it's more about the safety medical issue. Uh, we have to wait until this thing is really taking control, that we have control over it. We're fighting, as they say, the unknown enemy, and we have to wait until this thing has been settled and then it's deemed safe enough to do that. And most of all, as much as fans won't have the money they had to go to the ballpark like they did, as much as they'll be very cautious about going into an open venue based on and what other people, the way it's been, um, you want to play – in your home ballparks, the players want that, and the fans want to see their team. Okay. So let me let me ask you the, let me ask you this question. Um, George Steinbrenner and Trump were very very good friends. What do you think? What kind of advice do you think George Steinbrenner would be giving President Trump right now? I think Trump would have said. I mean, Steinbrenner would have told Trump <clears throat> the right thing. Hmm. As much as this is business. Do it when it's the right way to do it and make sure that it's safe. George Steinbrenner was a safety conscious individual. Mm. And I know that because he used to see conditions in other ballparks for his players that he didn't want. Did he he wouldn't say, my team ain't playing here unless you fix this, fix that. Mm. Uh and things like that. So yeah, I think George Steinbrenner would have took control and would have uh told baseball and told Trump, President Trump, no. Uh, mm. No sports until it's safe. Not only baseball, but all sports. You know, remember, uh, George Steinbrenner was also part of the uh, U.S. Olympic Committee. Yep. And he had a lot of, a lot of power and control and at, on that. And at one point, my from what I remember, he owned a basketball team. That was one of his first yeah. endeavors. He owned a basketball team. Right. He was a he was a true sports fan, um, George Steinbrenner. Yes, he was. Um, yeah. And mm -hmm. so, yeah, I, I know that he that that's my feeling too, um, Bridge. That he would have been telling Trump, "Listen, let's make sure that this is safe for all Americans, um, not just obviously sports fans, but let's yeah. make sure that." You know, all Americans are kept safe and, um, you know, will reopen this economy when it's at the absolute right time. When do you think, Rich, that our our world is, it'll never be the same, right? Our world has completely We're changed. New, no. We're in a whole different world now, Jesse. And, you know, my old saying, you know, we go go back and talk in the old office mm -hmm. with the walking dead. Yep. Right? Yep. We are the walking dead. Yeah, this I is... hate to say that. I hate to say that. You mm. know, I can get political with my views. Yep. Uh, but we're there. We're there now. Uh, and I keep telling all my friends, be safe, my family, everybody. The only difference is people are not dying and turning into zombies. Yeah. We do have a different world now. And we have to adjust to it. When will we ever get back to normal again after this? 
If we do, it's going to be a very long time. And especially for sports. It's sad. Yeah. Yeah. Which is entertainment, which is our diversion, and we're not going to get it. So, and, so um, if you if you had to give any advice to you know some of these owners, these sports um, organizations, what what advice would you be giving them? Like, what would be an alternative? Should they maybe do some reruns? Like on the Yes Network, I think they've been doing some you know vintage baseball. And stuff. Uh, they're doing it now, and I'm tired of looking at it. <laughs> You can only watch so much of it. <laughs> Look, I'm yeah. going to bump you off the air in a little while because I got to eat dinner yet. <laughs> and then I got to go, uh, I got to watch Empire winding down their, their uh, series. This season. And, season. Watch, and then watch the Oprah Network and watch <laughs> if loving you is wrong so I get some entertainment in my life. <laughs> Well, I know you've been keeping busy. I see that you do a lot of work. Um, yeah. And you're writing a lot. I'm adjusting. And I mean, I tend to be a loner anyway, so I don't mind it as long as it's quiet. Yeah. And, um, you know, I tend to be a loner so I can adapt to the change. Yeah. Yeah, I miss being out there. I miss being at the ballpark. miss being at ringside. miss being with some friends and others. I miss you guys. I don't know when I'm going to see you again. Yeah. I know. Um, it's been a long time. We, yeah, we, so, we decided to come back from, you know, we were in Tampa. We were running the homeschool out of Tampa. Yeah. And um, when we started to hear that things were getting so serious, you know, I'm, I'm so grateful that the one thing that I've always had is great insight. And I'm usually very proactive instead of reactive. And so, you know, I was here because my mom hasn't been feeling so great. And I said, you know, I really need to be close to mom. And I hope she's um, well. I hope yeah, she's she, well. she's she's definitely she's okay. I mean, you know, I miss we're, we're blessed. I miss yeah. Her. What a yeah. great <laughs> and so I was here, but you know, right at around the beginning of March, I said to Tony, look, I think we're gonna have to get the boys back home to New York because when if this thing really breaks out and it gets really serious, I want the boys to be home with their families, not exactly. you know, in the homeschool there. So, uh, but again, we've been so fortunate because they haven't skipped the beat. They've been in school uh, just like they have for the last nine months and they get to train with Tony on a daily basis online. So life of our boys from our homeschool, the baseball homeschool Institute um, has really continued as usual for them. Like it has for the last nine months. We'll definitely have things to have, have you. Yeah. Th th things are definitely, definitely, you know, what's I, um, what's eerie rich, you know, Tony and I have had to step out because, you know, there are things that have to get done and we'll Nothing's step open. out and, and well, nothing really is open, but the little bit that is open, you can sense, you can feel how people are distancing themselves from one another, yeah. how, you know, they're wearing masks and gloves and, you know, there's this sense of, um, of distrust in the air. Like no one trusts anything. They don't trust oh. being near other people. They don't trust stepping out. They don't trust going to the store or getting gas or the things that we would do on a normal day-to-day -day basis. People just don't trust it right now. So my oh. prayer is that we that we we start gaining some kind of normalcy in our world, whatever that may be, and that as we adjust to this new normal in our lives. We um, don't forget that at the end of the day, you know, there are people out there that are hurting and, you know, it, it'll be nice for us to be like the Steinbrenners um, and reach out to those that you are. Do what I do. Time. You, can't help them. you can't help them uh, financially. You can't help them. At least be uh, in the air. What helps is prayer. Yeah, and I've never prayed so hard. I'm going to tell you, mm. and I tell everyone, I've never prayed so hard. Mm. I am religious, but not like that. Every night for a good half hour before I retire for my day and night, and I'm catching up on my sleep. That helps. But <laughs> clean the yeah. closets, doing that. Uh, remember, this was going to be a year of me on the move. I was looking to move, right, and make that move to Arizona eventually, right. But you find everything. things to do. But yep. prayer is helpful. Absolutely. And I encourage people, no matter Absolutely. what your faith is, to pray. Yep. Because I know the band, I know that the Lord, and here again, I don't want to be a clergyman. But that's pastor. That's good. I think people, but you know what? I think that young people need to hear it from folks like you, Rich, that are yeah, in the sports world for years. 
that you know right. what that 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 we do need to turn to the one I call him the CEO of the universe, the one who created right. this world. And if he knows um, the basics, and the Bible says that he knows the hairs that are on our head, taking care right, of this coronavirus right. is not is not something that's difficult for him at all. So yes, he is the one that we should be turning to, and I think that it's so. Um, powerful for our young people to hear it from folks like you who have been surrounded exactly. by these major athletes all of your life. Um, so with that, my friend, I say thank you so much for joining me here tonight. Um, it was fun to catch up with you a little bit here. We'll do it more. We'll do it talk. more. I, I would love that. I would love for us to really get into doing our show the way we had said we have the platform. Oh, yeah, I for it. all bases covered. Yeah, all, I miss all it. bases covered. Um, and that's something that you and I could definitely dialogue a little bit on um, off the air. But um, again, thank you so much. Um, it was great to, um, you know, pay this. I want to thank you. I want to give my best to you all my love. And uh, even though we haven't seen each other in a while, mm -hmm. you're on my mind. You guys are on my mind all the time. Your family, you always yep. were, you always will be. And I want to wish the best and safe and well. God blessings to you, Tony, Anthony, the whole Baseball Institute, everyone involved. And just stay safe. Be with each other. Right now we need each other more than yep. ever. Okay? Absolutely. And um, I will see you guys soon. We have I'll technology so we can do it. But yep. you, my dear... You need to pick up the phone more often, not me. <laughs> I will. I will, Rich. I'm sorry. I'm always so crazy. You know me. I, I, I'm right. in a million projects at once all the time. But again, thank you so hope. much. God bless you. God bless, God bless you. you all. And uh, you read me, Bronx Chronicle. Elite Sports New York, Latino Sports. You know, I'm all over the place. So. Yep, Rich Mancuso, the famous Rich Mancuso. You can find him also on Facebook, Rich Mancuso. And um, we will definitely catch up again soon real quick uh, so we can continue to talk about how we, we bring this show to another level. Thank you, Jess. All right, Love Rich. you guys. All right, God bless. Bye. So thank you everyone who joined us here tonight. I hope that um, you um, you know enjoyed our tribute to Hank Steinbrenner and again, all of our love and prayers and um, our well wishes are with the Steinbrenner family. Good night, everyone. I will see you tomorrow night with another guest. <laughs>